Hi, I am Steve Ferenczi, and in 1956, at the Hungarian Revolution, I was 16 years old. The 1956 Hungarian Revolution was the first tear in the Iron Curtain. Hungarians from all walks of life rose up to fight against a brutal Soviet-installed Hungarian Communist government. Thousands of freedom fighters died fighting while others tortured and executed. 200,000 people were forced to flee. This year, October 23rd, 2006 marks the 50th anniversary of the Hungarian Revolution. Danny Benedicti now drives a taxi outside Manchester. 30 years ago, he was an apprentice metal worker in Budapest. As a young lad, I was brought up with the ideals of an independent Hungary and a free Hungary. I regarded myself as, as one a Hungarian who was doing what everyone else was doing. The, the, the thought of being a revolutionary as such didn't come to me till much later. Bela Liptak is a consultant engineer in Connecticut. In 1956, he was a university student in Hungary. Most people, I think, go through life without being able to say that this was or that was the moment which changed my life. That kind of an experience uh, is, is very special. Uh, what we had there was two, three thousand students, myself, 20 year old at the time. We want human rights and we don't want any form of oppression. No nation should ever occupy another. Yes, it has a dishwasher built in, dishwasher built in. Uh, uh... Lucy Soloy is an estate agent in New York. She was still at school when she saw the uprising begin. I was only 14, but I, I had a mind of my own at the age of 14, and I knew that we had to uh, do something to free our country. And so I just joined up. Greg Pongratz is now a pig farmer in Arizona. That autumn, in 1956, he was helping to manage a farm outside Budapest. I was 24 years old at that time, and I was working in a state farm just about 60 miles from Budapest. When I heard that uh, it's fighting in Budapest and uh, what's going on, I, in the beginning, I just didn't believe that. I said, it's impossible. Against the communist system, there is no revolution. It never was one. It began with a march that no one in Hungary thought could happen. For years, to whisper complaint against the Soviet Union and the ruling communist regime was to risk imprisonment or death. Now, thousands of university students were demonstrating openly against the repression under which all Hungarians lived. Even soldiers in the street looked on with approval. 
when we did march out, there was that tremendous applause and uh, emotion and uh, strangers running up to kiss and uh, hug and uh, it's hard to describe in words. And then as, as we marched, <clears throat> we seen uh, other spontaneous uh, signs like, uh, you know, the first thing to do, people walk out on their balconies and wave and applaud. And uh, what do they wave? They wave flags. And then one lady up on the third floor noticed that what she was waving was a Hungarian flag with a Russian insignia. And without any thought, she just went in, got a pair of scissors, cut out the Russian insignia, and those thousands of people on the street applauded because that's exactly what they would have done. Those days were just very spontaneous. Everybody knew exactly what to do. Workers returning home from their offices and factories joined the march. Ordinary people who felt they'd been trampled on too long. There was an awful lot of uh, red, white and green flags and um, various slogans about Ruskies go home and stuff like that and uh, I just couldn't believe it. They're all talking about independence for Hungary and it's time the bugger went and we didn't want him in the first place. Soviet tanks had first rolled into Hungary in the winter of 1944. They came as liberators after the Nazis but were to stay on as masters. On paper, Stalin had agreed to allow the people to set up their own democracy. It was a promise that proved worthless. As the Cold War divided Europe, dissent became a luxury the Soviet Union could not afford. They wanted Hungary to be run by a pro-Stalin communist government, and they had the means to impose it. The Soviets had brought with them their own brand of Moscow-trained Hungarian communists. Their leader was Matyash Rakoshin. Their weapon, the Avo, the hated secret police. Over the next few years, Rakoshi and his regime suppressed all opposition to the Communist Party. At one point, it was said, no less than 5% of the entire population had spent time in jail. A joke circulated. There are still three classes of people in the new Hungary. Those who have been in prison, those who are in prison, and those who are going to prison. You have to understand the feeling of a people as such, a million of people. The feeling, the way they were treated, the circumstances they had to live, the feelings towards people who were among them and pointed out and, uh, and put in charge of a horrible experiment which was going on in Hungary. I have been a factory worker. The conditions there was very desperate. They introduced the inhumane peacework system and they squeezed the last drop of energy out of our workers. And they speeded things up and they demanded higher performance for less and less and less. So our standard of living declined steadily. We couldn't even eat decent. A, buying a winter coat was a major investment. Several family members had to work together as a unit and make a plan who gonna get a winter coat next. The economic plan was a disaster. Workers in whose name the People's Republic had been set up found their life becoming intolerable. But to protest was a crime. One of our workers lost the self-control. Before payday, he ran out altogether. He had a large family and he was addicted to cigarettes and he was bombing cigarettes. Then he lost his nerves and ran out in the middle of the shop. Here I am, I worked all through my life and like a bum, I'm begging for a lousy cigarette. I don't know how to buy bread and milk next day for my children and he started cussing the regime and the Soviet Union. He disappeared and the propaganda brigade put up next day, big signs all over, so and so has been sentenced by people's court for agitation against the great Soviet Union and our socialist regime. So October the 23rd, 1956, was a revelation. People came out into the open to raise a banner for freedom and discovered they were not alone. 
the crowd was told about the 16 points, a program of peaceful change drawn up by the students. One of the organizers, still living in Hungary, was Imre Mech. Tel is tett tele volt az egész tér. Azért jöttünk ide, mert Ben József tábornok, a 48-as szabadságharcnak az egyik hőse, lengyel származású volt, harcolt az oroszok ellen, harcolt a mi szabadságunkért, és ebben az időben szimpátia tüntetést szerveztünk a lengyelek mellett. Egy diák fölmászott az emelvényre, és elmondta a 16 pontot, amelyből az első pont úgy kezdődött, hogy a szovjet csapatok térjenek haza. Russians out. That was the main demand. The students also wanted free elections, a legal opposition, and freedom from censorship. Their hopes were high. Soviet troops had withdrawn from Austria a year earlier, and just two days before, Poland had won substantial concessions from the Soviet leadership. They sang their national anthem. The first stirrings of hope for the people of Hungary had been the death of Stalin three years before. Stalin's death was a fantastic good news, you know. Uh, it was really like winning the sweepstakes. And uh, we really hope that something will happen, uh, and quite suddenly. And Stalin was, uh, without doubt, the most hated person in Hungary. We hated him religiously, you might say. A 50-foot monument to the man they hated stood in the city center. That afternoon, the demonstrators swarmed around it. Metal workers cut through the brazen legs and toppled Stalin from his marble pedestal. Stalin's uh, leg was cut at the knee. And then we also had the cables on. And then we started pulling. Then when it was nearly cut through with the blowtorches from the back of the knee, then it came down. But I do remember the sound. It's an incredibly eerie sound. It's a sigh of relief. You know, it's almost like a sound of sexual pleasure. I never quite, it's a very eerie sound and I uh, still remember it deeply. I even uh, remember it in my dreams. It was an incredible sound of several thousand people giving a sigh of joy. I had a great sense of uh, making history. And um, we thought that the whole world is looking at us and everybody in the world is happy. Even days after, I don't know how, but his head ended up a considerable distance away. And people would be casually walking down the street and all of a sudden they'd get a little hammer and start tapping at him and take a piece of souvenir. And then it was the common thing, have you got a piece of Stalin to keep for the future? It was really hitting at the symbol of oppression. It would have been uh, similar if, let's say, you come out of the death camps and pull down the statue of Hitler or something, or the SS sign. It was really the symbol of everything we hated. It was the most visible and manifest sign and symbol of Soviet occupation. Another group of demonstrators made for what are still the headquarters of Hungarian radio. They wanted their 16 points to be broadcast to the whole nation. The authorities allowed a delegation into the building to negotiate. But outside, with no news of progress, the crowd grew restless. Suddenly, a detachment of the AVO, the secret police, opened fire on the demonstrators. And all of a sudden, a burst of um, what appeared to be Tommy gun fire presumably over their heads initially. And then I remember a, a chap falling on the floor next to me. And uh, he must have had a, a severe wound because within minutes there was blood everywhere on the pavement. And as you were sort of walking in this blood, you could feel it on the feet and everything. I think people whisked him away to give him first aid. At which point they opened up fire again at us. And, um, a shout came over that let's go to the, the barracks to get something to fire back at them. We saw quite a few dead people by that time. And uh, we got as, as close as maybe a half a mile from the uh, radio station. By that time it was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And my sister was very, very scared. So we decided to go home. And we caught a streetcar going home. and. 
on our way home, there's a, a, a big armory, and there were soldiers on a streetcar that we were riding, and they were saying that they're going to go open up the armory and release all the weapons to the freedom fighters. Army trucks appeared full of soldiers, and everybody thought that they were going to fire at us because they had the Bren gun on the top and all armed to the teeth type of thing. And all of a sudden these lads were giving the, the rifles away to the, the students, the workers, whoever was there. Those first shots turned a peaceful protest into a revolution. Armed with the weapons of sympathetic Hungarian soldiers, the crowd laid siege to the radio station. By dawn, over a hundred people lay dead in the streets, but the Arvo had abandoned the building. The radio news editor recalls his arrest by the students. Next morning when the attackers of the radio came in, they were teenagers, 15, 16 years of age with two machine guns. And then the third one was uh, someone between 25 and 30. He said, I'm coming from the labor camp of Rechk. And you, you can, uh, uh, you can save your life if you are ready to take arms and fight for the freedom of the Hungarian people. And then came an officer after it. So it was a very mixed uh, sort of gathering, and uh, it was very difficult just to believe what, what, what happened. Who were these people who took over the radio, which was supposed to be well defended? And these this, this youngsters, these teenagers, they just took over the radio. Red Army tanks were already moving into Budapest as the authority of the Hungarian Communist Party disintegrated. They were too late for a quick kill. All through the night, workers had been arming themselves for a fight. What followed was a battle for the control of the city. On one side, Soviet tanks and the secret police. On the other, the people of Hungary. Unfortunately, there were too many of us and too few weapons. Somebody in my group came up with the ID. He says, George, let's go out to our own factory. I know where they, they are stocking the weapons for the factory. We brought out as many submachine guns and uh, rifles as we could. As we were coming out the door on the empty uh, highway, there was a Russian military passenger car coming, uh, Škoda, and, uh, and three officers got out from the car uh, as it stopped next to us. They didn't really know what was going on, they just heard some rumors. And one said, uh, Comrade, where are you taking these, uh, these uh, guns? <laughs> so, in a second, we did have to, to make up our mind. They had their own guns there, that they were ready to actually draw them. It was either them or us. So we started to fire and we killed them all. We took over the car. That's how we got our first guns. Many street fighters had never fired a gun before. Now they learned how hard it was to kill for the first time. The Russian soldiers, they were coming from uh, door to door out on the street. And, uh, and uh, I was in a second floor window and uh, I had a rifle, a mouser. And I pointed the head of the Russian soldier who was looking out and I pulled the trigger. And I saw the Russian soldier far down on the, on the sidewalk and I started to cry. It is a terrible feeling when you see that you shot somebody and is dead. I don't wish that feeling to anybody. And everybody was yelling over there, don't cry, come on, the Russians are coming, we have to defend ourselves. And I just had to go to the window and keep shooting. They were shooting too. I saw this uh, Škoda, a Czech car, belonging to the university, making a squeaking turn into the front of the university, followed by a Pobieda, a Russian-made uh, car used by the secret police and there was firing the Pobieda was shooting at uh, at the Škoda and uh, I was there with submachine gun on my uh, shoulder watching as the Škoda turned over 
Imre, uh, the driver, jumped out, ran away, and uh, my friend uh, Yanchi was lying there. He didn't even touch his gun, although he had one too. Bleeding, and the secret policeman kept shooting, and uh, I wanted to defend him, to uh, fire, and I couldn't. And uh, it was a very difficult moment for me. I just realized that I cannot shoot at people. Uh, he died. We counted 27 bullets in his body. And then I remember next morning, <clears throat> we were carrying his body from somewhere. And it was already stiff, and one of his uh, shoes fell off. And I had this crazy idea sometimes, go crazy in this situation, uh, that if I could just only get those shoes back, everything would be all right. And of course, you cannot do that once the body is stiff. So we covered Yanchi with the flag. Resistance groups formed spontaneously all over the city. 24 hours earlier, Danny Benedicti had been working in a factory. Now he had a machine gun and was fighting the Soviet army. Yeah, this is the place. On the morning of the 24th, between 8 and 9 o'clock, about 100, 150 of us left the radio. We came through the city, onto the river bank here, with the intentions of crossing over the bridge to free the political prisoners that were being held in order to restore the um, palace at that time. As we got to roughly this area, we opened the uh, fire up on, from the bridge, the river, and some of the buildings on the right. Half the group would already be on the square by then with very little or no cover at all except for a few benches and of course this wall here. I myself got behind the tree in this manner. I could hear the bullets sit in the tree, thudding into it, ricochets all around. The tree was a lot thinner then, so was I. And uh, eventually I zigzagged my way back, ran into that building via a glass door with the rest of us made our way to the top of that building in order to give covering fire to the lads on the uh, square below. But by the time we got up there, they, it was too late for them really because they were holding their arms up to surrender, taking white shirts off, waving them about. But regardless to all that, they were just mowed down. They had no chance at all. The first morning of the revolution, 30 of Danny Benedicti's comrades died fighting on the banks of the Danube. I was uh, 16 years old, just gone 16. And um, I, I've never seen death as such. I've never seen so many bodies lying about, but it didn't quite sink in. You, you just accepted it. I was horrified by my schoolmates, me, me comrades, me my friends being, being killed, shot, maimed, wounded, but I just accepted it as, as part of what was going on at the time. Outside the Parliament building, a huge crowd waited for news. Inside, the old regime was clinging desperately to power. Overnight, Imre Naj had been made Prime Minister, a gesture by the Stalinist party boss, Erno Gero, to appease the people and save his government. Naj was a senior party member himself, but he was not seen as Moscow's man and was not associated with the terror Hungary had lived through. Even Naj misjudged the mood. He called for order, calm and discipline, and that was not what the people wanted. They wanted to be rid of everything to do with the Soviet Union. And what they could get rid of, they did. Gerber nationalized the bookstores. 
young and old, and even throw out those books, and they tore up those, those hated communist Marxist books about Stalin's life, about Rakosh's life, or Lenin. How would you feel if you have to read day and night a book which you have no interest in, which a six-year-old child can feel that it is a lot of nonsense, and you must read it, not only read it, you have to learn it by heart. Because next day at the seminar, they are going to ask you, comrade, did you read this page and would you repeat it, please? Then you are a good, a good communist party member. The arrival of the Russian troops had focused the anger of the crowds. Anything they associated with the occupying forces was publicly and gleefully destroyed. The workers called a general strike and went into the streets to set about the impossible. Their task, to defeat two Soviet armored divisions with a ramshackle army of untrained civilians. There was no central organization to control the resistance, but one of their important strongholds was the Corvin Cinema. It was situated, then as now, in a rough, tough part of the city near a strategic barracks. Inside, it sheltered a growing army of its own. They knew the streets around it, the Russians didn't, and suffered. One of the Corvin Brigade was Danny Benedicti. It was very easy to defend. The, um, this being the cinema, a couple of alleyways at the front, which we had some heavy stuff. And uh, as you can see, the houses all around you. We've sort of occupied each and every room. The back of the cinema here, as I remember, was used as a burial ground. A lot of the lads were buried here in this corner. Their main occupation was eliminating the Soviet tanks. Did they open fire uh, indiscriminately on anything and anybody? If they, they saw somebody move down the street, they would virtually work their way down with cannon fire i.e. to collapse the building. And anybody, anything moving, they'd open machine gun fire. So obviously when a tank appeared, for your own safety you had to put that tank out of action because he didn't care or he didn't know who he was shooting at, he was just shooting. To cope with the tanks in, in the narrow streets was relatively easy because the whole idea was to get them in, draw them into the streets. Then they, they would sort of create confusion amongst themselves. They usually managed to get the first tank and the last tank. And whatever were in between, they, they just no way out. The Red Army tanks fell to a Red Army weapon. The Molotov cocktail invented by Russians in their street battles against the Germans was now used against them in Budapest. Lucy Soloy, then aged 14, knocked out her first tank with one. We got uh, bottles with, which we filled up with gas and uh, pushed some rags into it. And uh, on, a, on a truck that I was on, there were some pistols. So we took them along and uh, we sat on the top of the bridge waiting for the tanks to come. And when they came, uh, we threw them out of cocktail and cocktails on them. It stopped the first tank, and it went up in flames. It wasn't able to move. The older tanks, they had the air grill, the grill, the radiator, if you like, on the back of the tank behind the turret. So if you threw your bomb, your petrol bomb, onto that, obviously it would suck the burning fuel into the engine itself thus filling the tank with fumes, flames, whatever, you immobilize the tank. As their fame spread, the Corvin Brigade found new recruits. They chose their own commander, Greg Pongratz. In the beginning, the Corvin was only about 80, maybe 100 kids. But uh, we made so much damage to the Russians that everybody was uh, looking up to the Corvin, that was going on over there. And a lot of people came over there, kids, mostly. Uh, they were curious to see what's going on over there. 
they was hanging around only a couple of hours. They was talking with some of the freedom fighters and they just didn't want it to go away. They stayed over there and they said they, they're gonna fight also. And that's how the Corbin was growing. We had kids over there, dozens and dozens and dozens of them. They were waiting for weapons. So when the Russians, they came and they attacked, all those weapons from the Russian soldiers went to those kids. Armed and encouraged by their success, the young people and children of Hungary were fighting the Red Army divisions to a standstill. What was happening seemed incredible to the winners and losers alike. Later, a count would reveal that 200 tanks had been put out of action, but still the authorities dismissed their opponents as hooligans. A typical hooligan was a young boy called Johnny, or Janci in Hungarian. Janci. He was about 13. Many, many times I told him to go home, your mother is waiting for you. He never wanted to go home. He knew the danger very well because many kids died beside him. He comes in to the office running and he was yelling, boys, bashi, boys, bashi, I'm in trouble, my mother is coming. I said, now what can I do with you? But outside I heard some noises and uh, a woman uh, is telling to one of the guards at the corridor that get out of Get, get out of my way with that gun because I'm going to give you one that your head going to fall off. I want to see the commander. So the door opens. John, just before that, he jumped under the bed. And uh, the door opens and the woman comes in. It was, you can, you can see on her that she was the wife of a worker. So it's, she comes in and she said, who's the commander? I said, what can I do for you? Where is my son? I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, but I have so many kids over here, I don't know which is your son. And he tells me his name. And I was in trouble because I didn't want to lie, but I didn't want to discover the kid either. And in the meanwhile, the door opens, and from the first aid room, they send me up a cup of coffee. And the kid who brought me the coffee, it was another 15-year-old kid. He had a head wound and a big bandage on his head. And the blood was coming through the bandage. And when the woman saw this kid with the bandage, she started to cry. She said, oh, my Johnny, my Johnny, I think, I don't know, I, he's dead. He's, he, 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 I think I was hallucinating when I saw him a few minutes ago down at the street. I, I don't know where to look for him. I, I, I'm gonna check the hospital, but please, God, let me, find him in the hospital, I, I shouldn't go to the cemetery to find him. And she was crying. And once I see the bed cover, it's lifting up and young, she's coming out from under the bed and she's, he's going to his mother and, Mommy, I'm here, take a look, I'm not even wounded, there's nothing wrong with me, please, but you're not gonna take me home, you're gonna let me stay here. And the woman, she just couldn't say anything. She was just hugging the kid and kissing him and, and, and he was in glories and he was crying, but these tears, they were for happiness. And uh, later on she said that, uh, what do you mean that I'm not gonna take you home? I'm not gonna let you out. I'm gonna hold you until you, we go home and when you, we get home, you're gonna see what you're gonna get from your father. So anyhow, Later on, I asked this woman that does she know that we all have mothers? And all our mothers, they just as same as nervous and uh, they crying like you do. What would happen with this country if every mother, mine and all the other mothers, they would come over here, they would get their young chick, their kid, and they would take it home? Thanks to these kids that the Russians, they left Budapest and we achieved the freedom of our nation. Thanks to your son, your 13 year old son, who is a hero of this nation. Now you want to take it home, you have all the right to do it. I tried to send him home many times. He didn't want to go because he felt that his obligation to his country 
is to stay here and fight with us. And uh, the woman wiped his, her tears and he said, Commander, you know the responsibility you carry. The life of these kids are in your hands. Please watch them. This is the only thing we have, our children. I'm not going to take him home. I'm going to let him stay here. He said, I don't believe, and my husband even less, that you're going to win. But what you achieved until now, that was the seventh miracle of the war. And if you really achieve the victory, if the Russians, they really going to go out, that's going to be the eighth one. And I don't believe it's going to happen, but I'm going to leave my son here. And she left. It was not only in Budapest that the battle was fought, and it was not only against the Russians. As much a target for the people's anger were the Arvo, the secret police. Driving into the town of Majorova 30 years ago, a communist journalist from Britain found an example of their handiwork. People were standing around in the streets in a great state of distress. People were weeping, and people came to the car and said, would we go to the cemetery and see the bodies? And we went to the cemetery, and there laid out were the bodies of 80 people who had been on an unarmed demonstration and had been shot down, had been machine gunned by members of the Arvo, of the, of the security police, the day before. There had been a demonstration, an unarmed demonstration, uh, against the Russian occupation of Hungary. And the people had marched, and as they marched, uh, the Arvo men from the... From the, from the roof uh, of the police headquarters uh, had opened fire on them without any reading of the riot act, without any warning, uh, without any, and had mown them down. I had never seen dead people before in my life, and I saw these 80 bodies, young girls and uh, young men and mothers with their children, and they were laid out there with the dried blood still, you know, the blood still on their, on their clothing. And people were crying, and they pushed us foreign journalists to the front so that we could see. And then they took us to the National Committee, uh, that's to say the, the committee that had been elected to run the revolution. All I could say was I promised to tell the, to tell the truth about what had happened. People said, uh, you don't know what it's been like living here. We've had eight years, you, 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 you've been told it's been eight years of socialism. In fact, for us, it's been eight years of hell. And they told me the pitiful wages they got and the Arvo men were getting, I think it, it, it was an incredible figure, incredible coefficient. Uh, they got something like 20 or 30 times as much as ordinary workers. It was supposed to be a worker's state, and yet this security police were really onto a very, very good thing. And people said they're, they're not uh, communists, they're animals who sell themselves to the Russians, and we shan't leave a single one of them alive. People were very, very angry indeed. The lieutenant who had apparently ordered this massacre uh, was, uh, had been beaten up and was lying wounded in the hospital. And the people outside were demanding him because they, they wanted to execute him. And uh, the director, after a consultation with his colleagues, decided that to avoid upsetting the other patients, he would have to let them have him. And I was standing there by the gate. There was a, a wire mesh fence and people were shaking it and, and, and shouting for him and shouting, murderer, murderer. And he was brought as close to me as you are on a step, on a stretcher, a, a man under sentence of death, something again that I'd never seen before. He was, his head was going from side to side and there was spit coming out of his mouth and he was clearly very frightened. And as soon as they got to the gates, the gates opened and the people dragged him off the stretcher and kicked him uh, and beat him to death. And it took about 10 minutes and then they, they hanged him, I think upside down uh, from a tree. I did a lot of interviews on that, over a over hundred interviews on that. Uh, and they said that the people who were foremost in that lynching, uh, or as I would call it, uh, uh, execution of a murderer, were people who had lost relatives and loved ones uh, in, that, in that atrocity. This was rough, rough justice, uh, but it's the sort of justice that people take when, you know, when, when an atrocity like that has been, has been committed. I won't say the Hungarians were animals to the Hungarians. The, the, the hatred of the people against a few that were animals, trained as animals, if you like. I mean, the, 
It was just a hatred that built up over the years. You, you, you don't talk about anything because the word Argo, I mean, it, it sounded, you know, everybody looped around three times before, you know, it would proceed. If you said there was an Argo around there. I mean, even I, as a, as a, a student, knew the meaning of the word Argo, and it was not very pleasant, I can tell you. The Arvo were officially disbanded. Five days earlier in Budapest, they'd massacred 200 unarmed demonstrators. Now these experts in fear learn to fear being arrested themselves. The headquarters of the Budapest Communist Party are in Republic Square. That morning, the seventh day of the revolution, an Arvo detachment still controlled it. News got out that they'd seized some students, so a group of fighters turned up to demand their release. Not for the first time, the Arvo opened fire on a crowd of Hungarians. This time, their targets were not defenseless. And all of a sudden, the firing broke out. And I've noticed a tank with the Hungarian coat of arms on the turrets were making its way towards the building. And stretcher bearers running after him. You could recognize the stretcher bearers by having a white band across the head. And all of a sudden, all hell was let loose. There was grenades exploding, heavy fire from and to the building. people were left dead in the square. Even stretcher bearers came under fire as they ran forward to help the wounded. But the Arvo were outnumbered and outgunned, and in the end could only surrender. The angry shout went up from the crowd, Ninch Fogoy, no prisoners, no prisoners. The secret police was here that they, they was the instrument of the terror against the population, because they have been told you are the fist, iron fist of the socialism, you smash the enemies of the people and so on and then they have been paid well but when they had to make up his mind they're gonna open fire on our own population in defense of the interest of a foreign occupational power they condemn themselves to death there were 48 arvo in the building some escaped some had already been shot dead the ones who were captured suffered the worst i've seen um, the officers of the arvo that were captured were strung up by the feet on the trees outside and people started kicking and saying that's for torturing my father, that's for torturing my brother and I would imagine eventually they got kicked to death and all of a sudden thousands and thousands of foreigns appeared in 100 foreign bills and they were stuffing this money into the, the mouths and, and pockets and there's money lying all out. I've noticed one for example, hanging from a tree. He just had his boots and pants on, stripped to the waist, apparently dead. Um, I would say there must have been about 40, 50,000 foreigners all around him. People never bothered to pick up any other money or anything, but it was just, just a way of expressing that you were a paid torturer, you, you, so here's your final payment. I served at that time as an ambulance man, volunteer. We grabbed one secret policeman because we must have the information really where the students are. I said, if every policeman, secret policeman, will be killed, nobody will tell us who, where are the students. So we wanted to save one of them. We uh, created a circle around him to save him because the people, the crowd was so mad and we've been worried they killed him also. Now when we made this circle around him, suddenly somebody grabbed the rifle with a barrel end and crushed his skull. So he dropped to death. The street fighters searched the building for the students. In the basement, they found mutilated corpses, and in revenge, Arvo guards were flung out onto the street to lie twisted among the rubbish of their own secret files. 
there was no forgiveness then. There was no forgiveness because we didn't know how much, how long this uprising will last, how long we are going to be free. But we did not want them to, to forget what they did was against any humanitarian rules of the world. The people themselves, they just acted, acted violently. You would have done the same thing. Anybody would, would have done the, the same thing after being depressed for so many years. All of the pent-up hatred, the helplessness, the rage which started building up in all of us, finally got released. Uh, I don't remember somebody in the Republic Square told me who, who took up firing position nearby. Tears were streaming down, and I have been shouting and singing. And sometimes tears uh, stream down my face. Because like an earthworm, we felt so helpless before. You was in the clutches of an almighty state. You couldn't move. You could, uh, one careless statement could done away with you. And finally, in being positioned when you can do something about it. Whatever I did, I did it for my people and nation. I have been mot motivated then and now. I didn't kill Hungarians. The Arvo who survived slipped away into hiding as the new government started its reforms. Hungarians, it was a time like no other. Soviet tanks were rumbling out of Budapest and soon it was promised they would be leaving the country altogether. On the banks of the Danube, people watched the families of Soviet diplomats packing their bags. The two top Politburo men sent by Moscow were also leaving, apparently accepting that Russians were no longer wanted in Hungary. A close supporter of Imri Naj was the city police chief, Shandor Kopachi. He watched the Politburo men depart. Now, now, this is the day that the Parliament in the day that the Parliament was 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 és Mikolyán könnyekkel a szemében mondotta, hogy nekünk ki kell most vonulni, így mondotta, ki kell vonulni Budapestről és Magyarországról, és hát nagy elvtárs, kérjük azt, hogy mentse, ami menthető. De magyarul tehát azt mondotta, hogy mentse a kommunista szisztemből azt, ami, ami az adott helyzetben meg lehet menteni. The last days of October were the beginning of a political spring. New parties were born, old, suppressed ones were resurrected. Non-communists were brought into the government. A population starved of truth was sated by dozens of new pamphlets and papers. Censorship was gone. Budapest was alive. Everybody knew what to do. And the factory workers knew how to organize their factories to eliminate the bureaucratic nonsense and to get whatever they were producing, produced right. And the professors know how to teach, and uh, the shopkeepers know how to run the shop. And if you remove this artificial, unnecessary, uh, dogmatic structure, life becomes so free and happy. It was unbelievable. Uh, the streets were full of uh, farmers bringing in food, uh, these are people who usually are uh, very stingy and they were distributing food on the street corners freely. There were uh, boxes on the side of the street containing paper money. Just a sign above it saying that if you want to donate anything... It was just a great unity. I mean, everybody was equal whatever your qualifications or whether you were a university professor or a minor from the provinces, everybody was the same.
people behave like children when the teacher left the, the schoolroom. And uh, I saw many adults uh, behaving like children. I remember I was uh, walking uh, through the uh, street and I met an old man who was watching uh, a picture of Rakush, which was on the ground. And uh, when he saw me coming, I was a few feet from him, he spit on the picture and then looked at me and grinned. And he didn't know me, he didn't know who I was, but his face said, if I want, I can spit on him, and there is not a thing you can do about it, whether you like it or not. He was telling me that I can spit on whomever I want. Many people said obscenities, just to show you that they can do it, you know, like the Russians. And then look happy and look around, that nothing happened, you know, the world didn't collapse, nobody grabbed them. The prisons were opened, and out came the victims of the years of repression. Most had been imprisoned for their political beliefs, but there were religious prisoners too. The leader of the Catholic Church in Hungary, Cardinal Mincenti, had confessed under pressure to a charge of conspiring against the state. Now he told of the misery of his seven years in jail. He just discussed about his experience in the prison, how they tortured him. He mentioned about, uh, uh, for example, they put a woman, nude woman, into his cell, embarrassing him because the high priest and so and uh, beated his genital organs also. He wanted more to know what happening. And he wanted to know what happening now in Hungary. And he said, I cannot say anything until I learn from every angle what happened. And, and the delegations to delegations visited him day and night. In the euphoria of the moment, Catholics and communists pledged to restore Hungary together. But the danger was not past, and among those who knew that was a tall, young army officer, Colonel Paul Malata, who was about to be made Minister of Defense. He and Prime Minister Naj knew that Soviet forces were not withdrawing as promised. Naj warned that unless they did, he would take Hungary out of the Warsaw Pact. They did not, and that evening he declared to the world that Hungary was a neutral country. But the world had another concern. The Suez Canal, lifeline of Europe, in a dramatic sequence of events, became a cause of war when President Abdul Nasser announced its seizure. That same day, the British and French invaded the Suez Canal. The crisis had been brewing for some days, but its explosion could not have come at a worse time for Hungary. We understood immediately that when uh, the Suez invasion happened, Hungary is just going to be one of many things going on in the world. And this was like carving it in stone to the Russians that we are so busy with Suez that there is no way that we will do anything in Hungary, that you have a free end in Hungary. I, I remember that was really the first time I really was scared, not so much during the shooting, but uh, when I heard about Suez. And within half an hour, the opinion of everybody around me was that we are finished because there's no way that the Russians would miss that chance to come back. This time the Russians took no chances. 150,000 fresh troops and 3,000 tanks were sent in to crush the revolution. Fighters were fighting, and the ordinary people were very somber, very, very somber, because it was the dashing of all the dashing of all their hopes. And uh, one could feel, you know, a kind of physical feeling of fear and hatred when the tanks came down the street. The Russian tactic was to take it back block by block, you see. And against them at that stage in Budapest, they had very fragmented guerrilla forces, uh, each of whom had a sort of block uh, that they were that they were controlling, and then they were falling back. And they were fighting with machine guns and petrol bombs, you know, Mol Molotov cocktails uh, against tanks. And really, they didn't stand a chance. The Battle of Budapest was bloody and one-sided.
with the Hungarian army disorganized, it was left to the street fighters to resist where they could. But they were without a leader. Imre Naj had fled to the Yugoslav embassy, and his defense minister, Malata, had been arrested by the very Russians with whom, naively, he had gone to negotiate in person. I told Malater that it's possible that I don't know well enough the history, but I don't remember one single situation when the highest commander of the armed forces went to the enemy to ne negotiate about anything. I said, what happens if they're going to catch you and they're going to keep you over there? I told him that you're not going over there as Paul Molitor. You're going over there as the Secretary of Defense of the Revolution. What happens if they're going to keep you there? They hanged him. Innocent people got shot down purely by queuing up for their food. I mean, I've seen that myself. People will be waiting for the bakery to open to buy the bread and the milk, and an armored car would thunder down the street and it would open fire on them. <laughs>